say she was also talking about experiments of that kind. Today I'm going to talk about slightly different kind of experiments, ones which are looking for new light particles, whether or not they're the dark matter. So a lot of the uh, particles that uh, occur in BSM theory, such as the QCD axion, are motivated somewhat independently of whether or not they actually do make up all of the dark matter in our local neighborhood. The QCD axion still solves the strong CP problem, even if there's a very, very small present-day abundance, which you wouldn't be able to detect through the kind of experiments that we are talking about. So, okay, how can we try to look for uh, states if they're not the dark matter? In the first lecture, I talked about how to look for the effects of very heavy states through their uh, higher dimensional operators in the standard model. But with new light states, there are different ways of doing things, and we can be much, much sensitive to extremely tiny couplings. So broadly speaking, uh, we're either going to be looking for sort of virtual effects or real effects. So either off-shell particles, so mediating forces, or on-shell production of actual new particles. And which one is the most useful in any given case will depend on the mass and couplings of the particles involved. For example, in the standard model, we saw the effects of the gravitational force far before we saw gravitational radiation. It was much easier to see the effects of the force mediated by the graviton. On the other hand, we saw neutrinos by producing them and then detecting them uh, well before, well, neutrino interactions, neutrino mediated interactions do exist, but uh, I'm actually somewhat unclear as to uh, whether or not these act, I think they may be detectable in some circumstances. Anyway, somewhat unclear on that. Difficult. Okay, so in a beyond standard model context, these things are often called fifth forces. And we're going to spend the first part of the lecture talking about these and how to look for them. Okay, so there are, of course, depending on the way that a new particle couples the standard model, there'll be various different kinds of effects it has. And one of the biggest uh, sort of questions is whether we couple coherently to like bulk matter, so big objects. So in the standard model, gravity does. You can take big objects and they will have a bigger and bigger uh, source, a bigger and bigger gravitational field, whereas under EM, big objects are naturally neutral. Uh, it's rather hard to make a sort of big object charged and to the amount that it could be. So EM, mostly neutral. You try hard. So, there's going to be the question of, yeah, what, given our coupling, are we going to get uh, big objects sourcing big, bigger and bigger fields? So for scalar and vector couplings of a new particle, so the kind of uh, couplings we talked about uh, in the atomic clock section yesterday, so things like a coupling to... Uh, fermion mass-like coupling, or coupling to a uh, kinetic term, or things like that, uh, or some generic coupling of a vector, say A prime mu to some set of fermion things in the standard model, these will generically have some uh, coupling to a big object that scales as the size of the object. Um, effectively, these are coupling to something that looks like a bit like the sort of mass or whatever of the object, which is going up as it gets bigger. On the other hand, uh, 
axion-like couplings, pseudo-scalar type. So uh, coupling of like our A, G, G tilde, or the couplings to fermions. So there's a lot of Fs there. Let's do, say, electron. Because of the parity properties of these, these couple to spin. So unless you make a big object with all of the spins pointing in the same direction, otherwise known as like a magnet or something, then if you don't do that, then this won't couple coherently to a big object. Like the spins of fast fermions on the Earth are generally pointing in randomish directions, modulo the sort of uh, magnetic core, etc. But these kind of particles, unless you have some coherent spin thing, won't have a volume scaling coupling to matter. Okay, so the easiest things to look for, uh, certainly if they're long range, are going to be these kind of couplings. And we'll focus on the scalars because these are somewhat easier to treat. Okay, so let's say that we have some scalar. So we've got our scalar phi. We've got our usual gate term. We've got some mass for it. And then we've got some uh, coupling, say, to, uh, I don't know, to nucleons or whatever. Then, as we'll go over in the problem sheet, if we have some source, so some set collection of nucleons or whatever at the origin, then the phi that we set up will be of the Yukawa form. So you'll have a e to the minus ur over r. So this is we yeah work out on the problem sheet. It's all, of course also very standard. So at small radii, so at r significantly less than the uh, Compton wavelength of the uh, scalar, then this looks just like a uh, inverse square plus some constant term plus small corrections. If we are at R significantly larger than the Compton wavelength of our particle, then the thing that dominates is the e to the minus mu R part, and we're exponentially suppressed. So the uh, potential that we get, so R and then our phi, R, we have a part that looks like a 1 over R potential, which will have, in terms of force will give us a usual inverse square law type force. And then once we get past, so this is at, and this say is the inverse mass scale. And for a massless particle, this would continue out to extremely small, sorry, extremely large radii. But once we get past this scale, we go very quickly to zero. So this is poorly drawn, but you get the picture. Inverse square, and then very quickly to zero. OK, so the obvious, uh, and also the point is, since this equation of motion is, uh, the equation of motion from this Lagrangian is linear, if we take lots of small objects, we can superpose the fields from all of them linearly. So the fields from some complicated objects are just summing up the Yukawa type field we get from each little bit of those objects. OK, so how do we actually, say, look for this? Well, the obvious kind of thing is to look for some, if the mass corresponds to a long range for this force, such that we can actually probe in some reasonable laboratory or beyond scale, then we can look for the deviation from the inverse square law. It'll be inverse square law at distances shorter than this, but then die away faster. So the biggest fractional, so, so deviation from 1 over r squared force, which is what we get if we just had gravity. So fractionally largest at distances of order the inverse mass scale of whatever our new particle is. So people have done tests at a whole range of mass scales. And 
Again, this is something that you'll derive in the uh, problem set. But if we look at the constraints on coupling, uh, then an experiment at some given scale, say, uh, whatever, some length scale, which it, so this is length scale r, will be exponentially suppressed in terms of its constraints at uh, larger masses, because you're in this exponential suppression region, and then will be power law suppressed at lower masses. So you get some constraint like that from some experiment, which is testing, say, the force between things separated at some characteristic scale r. And there's a whole set of these things, which I now sort of cover a whole range of things. So they go below gravitational strength forces at some distance. So this is around 1 over m Planck, say, at a distance of around uh, 10 to the minus 4 meters. And the largest scale tests of this kind are on solar system scales. So of order, um, I don't know, light hours or similar. I um, can't remember the exact numbers there. But so over a very wide range in scales, if you have some force, which is even much, much weaker than gravity, we're talking around like of order 10 to the minus sort of 10-ish ever M Planck, uh, sorry, 10 to the minus 5-ish or whatever, 10 to the minus 10 on the force, then uh, you can see the deviation from the inverse square law by basically just doing the naive thing of taking, yeah. Okay, so, well, a scalar mediator will generally make it so that uh, everything is attractive or everything repulsive. A vector can have uh, positive and negative charges. Um, that's one feature. In terms of, uh, so if you just have non-relativistic matter, all of the same kind, um, and you are looking for, say, the dis difference between some uh, additional scalar and vector components, then that's not going to be the uh, easiest thing to check directly from that, I think. Um, certainly in terms, of its in terms of its behavior, in terms of radiation and stuff, and in terms of relativistic seconds, there'll be differences. But uh, yeah, come back to that one. OK. So um, yeah, so over a very wide range in length scales, so down here in the lab, you go from doing things like you put a very small sphere of order size microns next to some wall. You trap this optically, and you look for forces on it as you vary its distance from the wall. So this is on the 10 to the minus 5 meter scale and so on. Up to at larger distance scales, you take uh, torsion pendulum experiments where you have two disks which are able to spin. You do the clever thing of cutting holes in the disks such that the geometry is when you turn this one, the torque that you exert on the bottom one through the uh, force that was purely inverse square cancels just geometrically. You arrange the holes such that you don't get any torque if it was purely inverse square. Then you look for, you turn this one, you have a shield in the way between them to make sure that any like extraneous charges or whatever don't give you some electromagnetic forces, and then you see if the bottom one turns when you turn the top one, which would indicate some non-inverse square force. And then at the very large length scales, you look for how planets, the moon, satellites fall. So you have this thing over a wide range of length scales where we're looking for deviations from uh, an inverse square law. OK, so one point which, uh, again, <laughs> so the first part of the lecture is sort of introduction to the problem set. When the mass gets very small, or equivalently, the range of this force gets very long, we have a bit of a problem, because there, the deviations from inverse square behavior are rather minor. You're in the part where it looks very much like an inverse square. And, okay, so it will, you will get an additional effect as well as gravity, so your force will be our G, M, M, m1, m2 over r squared plus approximately our scalar coupling 
squared times like our charge one, charge two under this scalar over r squared, and then some small corrections. But in terms of measurements, this will just look like giving g newton a slightly different value. So it's rather hard to tell that something different is going on there. This, so this then comes back to the question of how can we tell that uh, our force has actually got a spin zero, comp part of it comes from spin zero, and part of it comes from spin two. That is coming right now. Yes, sorry, that, that was just, uh, that was the intro to this. So the point about, exactly as Jed was saying, is that the spin zero part, the scalar, doesn't actually couple to, when you do the full GR version, which you won't see from just writing out the normal flat space-time couplings, it doesn't end up coupling to the gravitational field. So in particular, you've got, uh, in, in the full GR setup, we could write down terms which look like, uh, if we just look at the stress-energy tensor, our scalar field times, say, the strength of the stress-energy tensor, so this would be like uh, G mu nu T mu nu phi. So those are the kind of things that we're able to write down there, but the matter stress-energy tensor does not get contributions from the gravitational energy of whatever an object is. In the most extreme case, if we have a black hole, then the stress energy tensor is zero everywhere. But it still, of course, sources a big gravitational field. Whereas, basically by the no hair theorem, it won't source this phi field at all. So the best way to look for, well, one of the best ways to look for whether you have some scalar component to your force is to look at differences in terms of whether object, the gravitational field of objects gravitates. So that's what's called the strong equivalence principle. Well, people use the words in somewhat different ways in somewhat different contexts, which is slightly unfortunate. But basically, that gravitational binding energy gravitates. So you'll work out one of the consequences of this in the problem sheet, but another would be that if we had some uh, scalar component of the force, then let's say we have the sun sitting there, we have the earth, and we have the moon. In the normal gravitational setting, then the earth and the moon have a uh, the same ratio of gravitational to inertial masses, they fall in the same way around the sun, so everything's okay, and it looks like the moon can just orbit the Earth happily without having to worry about all this, modulo tidal effects. If you had, now the Earth, though, has a different uh, ratio of gravitational binding energy to its total mass than the moon does. It's more tightly gravitationally bound. So if you had some scalar force that didn't take into, that didn't actually get sourced by gravitational binding energy, then uh, this is called the Nordbelt effect. The moon and the earth would fall differently towards the sun because they would have a different, effectively, ratio of gravitational and inertial masses according to this scalar force. So what you'd get is you'd get some uh, deviation of the moon's orbit due to it feeling a different force, uh, different force ratio than the Earth when it's falling around the sun. Deviations of moon's orbit. And that effect works as long as our force has got a range which is, so if our inverse mu is longer than of order an astronomical unit, you'll see the effect of that. And this is constrained to be significantly weaker than gravity. So even in this case, uh, if you go to very large masses, you find that, uh, I can't remember where the exact thing is, but somewhere around here, the strong equivalence principle tests rule out larger couplings than gravity, even at uh, extremely small masses. <laughs> 
OK. But there are also uh, constraints that are, even, that are usually even stronger from something called the weak equivalence principle. So the strong equivalence principle was that uh, gravitational energy gravitates in the same way as normal energy. The weak equivalence principle is that the ratios of gravitational to inertial, so I'll see if there's a better chalk anywhere. Okay. To inertial mass is the same for all objects. Material objects here. So, whereas the strong equivalence principle is only uh, to violate that, we need to couple differently to gravity. To violate the weak equivalence principle, what we need is, say, we take a sphere of one element, like aluminium or whatever, we take a sphere of some other element, beryllium, of the same inertial mass, but then they would feel different forces in the field of some distant body. So they would have different attractive forces experienced towards, say, the sun. And if you have this kind of thing happening, then you can do very sensitive tests to look for it. And the instrument, which uh, at over a very wide scale, set of length scales is the best way to look for this, is the torsion balance. And this does something quite clever. So naively, what you do is, okay, you try and make two spheres with, say, exactly the same inertial mass. They move in the same way if you push them. Uh, and then look at how, what the gravitational force on each of them is. But that is going to be a pretty error-prone procedure. You need to try and fabricate things exactly the same mass. There's a lot of uh, experimental awkwardness there. The torsion pendulum works in the following way. So let's, uh, let's start over here, I guess. So it's basically what, it, what you might think. You have, a, you have some fiber, and then mounted to the fiber is some arm. And at the end of the arm are your two test masses. This is a sort of very naive description. The real ones are somewhat more complicated. OK, now let's say we have forces on this test mass and some different force on this test mass, because it's a different mass, because it's got some equivalence principle violation, whatever. OK, then the combined force, we'll assume this thing is light. The combined force on the object is, in the direct, is F1 plus F2. So assuming that the fiber and the support are light compared to the objects, this thing will just hang in the direction set by F1 plus F2. So now we want to ask, what's the torque about the axis of the fiber? What we're going to sense is whether or not this fiber twists. So if we... Uh, do that, we want to look at F1 plus F2 over F1 plus F2. That is the normal, that is the direction here. And we want to dot that with the torque here. So this one is at this one is in position R1, this one is in position R2. Then the torque from this mass is R1 cross F1, and the torque from this mass is R2 cross F2. So we can work this out. So expanding this, we've got our F1 dot. This component vanishes because you have two F1s and this is perpendicular to F1. F2 similarly. So this is F2 dot R1 cross F1 plus uh, F1 dot R2 cross F2. And then exchanging uh, the order of these things and rearranging, we get that This is equal to R2 minus R1, because you get a sine flip when you flip the order of this thing, dotted with F1 cross F2. 
So what we see is that, so this is the torque. We only get a non-vanishing torque about the fiber axis, so the thing only twists if the forces on our two objects are parallel. They can be different in magnitude, uh, like say we accidentally made this mass a bit heavier than this mass or whatever, so they could have different magnitudes, but if they were both pointing downwards, if they were both just being attracted to the center of the Earth or whatever, then you wouldn't get any torque about here. It would just make the thing hang slightly differently. However, if they're feeling uh, forces in different directions, then you can get a torque. So effectively, what this is sensitive to is uh, different directions of down. Okay, so that's cool, but how do we actually get that? Because if we were just sitting uh, above a spherical Earth, then even if they are attracted like differently to it, because you have some weak equivalence principle violating force, then they'll both just be attracted downwards. You won't actually have this directional difference. So what you need to do in order to get this, you need some kind of asymmetric source distribution. If your force is short-ranged, you can get this very simply by putting your experiment at the bottom of a cliff. So here's our topography. Here's the hut where we're doing the experiment. And here's our experiment. So let's say that our force has some range where it's feeling stuff. So this is this scale is the inverse mass of our force. Then we are seeing stuff in this little circle here. So the net force will be in a direction which is basically that way. So let's say that one of our objects feels this force more strongly than the other. Then one of the objects will feel gravity from the center of the Earth plus a little bit of this force, a noble force like that. So this is, say, an aluminum thing. A beryllium thing will feel the force from the center of the Earth plus more of this thing. And that means we get an overall different direction. We, these things feel different directions of down, and the pendulum will be torqued. And so as, as you go up to longer length scales, you can play the same trick. At scales of miles and whatever, you can use so miles, you can use natural features like mountains. You want a few mountains nearby. On scales of the Earth, you can use the fact that uh, like features like the sort of asymmetries of the crust, etc. The fact that Earth is not a perfect sphere. And once you're at distances greater than an astronomical unit or so, you can use the fact that we're here on the Earth, here's our experimental hut, and the sun is sitting out here, not to scale. So the force from the sun is directed uh, this way. Force from the Earth is directed this way. So if these two things are attracted differently to the sun, you'll have different horizontal components. Again, you'll have different directions of down. So across length scales, all the way from of order meters to however long you want, you do have, in the neighborhood of us, an asymmetric source distribution. So if you have some weak equivalence principle violation, this is an extremely sensitive test of it. So the constraints you get, so meter or so hill, meters, so, down, so the force should be less than of order 10 to the minus 7 of gravitational strength at short distances, and at long distances should be less than of order 10 to the minus 11. So you have extremely strong bounds on how large such a force can be. It must... Uh, the difference between these two things and the resulting force must be significantly weaker than gravity. Okay, so um, 
these constraints, and also fifth force constraints and strong equivalence principle constraints, are, yes? Oh, exactly, yeah. So that, well, yes. So given the model, you need to work out how it couples differently to protons versus neutrons versus electrons, etc., and then go from there. But the point is that this happens somewhat generically. So let's say that we just coupled it to something like uh, a G phi coupling to Higgs. That's the sort of lowest dimensional coupling of a scalar to the standard model that we can write down. Um, then the Higgs is responsible for contributing some of the mass of particles, but not all of it. You have contributions from EM, you have contributions from QCD, etc. So since this is only talking to the Higgs part, then the other contributions to the mass won't uh, result in, sort of won't contribute to the phi coupling, so you'll naturally just get a different ratio. The only way to arrange such that you don't get that is to make it so effectively it couples to the stress energy tensor. It's got to couple to exactly that. Talk a bit about whether that's actually a stable, uh, sort of quantum mechanically sensible thing in the problem sheet. But generically, if you do anything other than that, if you just couple it to some random operators or whatever, then through uh, effectively renormalization, the fact that you've got to add up all the contributions to the mass from all the different sources to get to your nucleus or atom or whatever, then you will have different couplings to different objects. Exactly. Yes. So um, I expect that they're chosen due to different ratios of protons and neutrons. Uh, I don't have those numbers in my head at the moment for the common isotopes. But yeah, you want it so it's got some different number, say, of different ratio of protons and neutrons. Yeah, and of course. So these, these quotes are for, um, yeah. So EP violation at, I think, oh, let's try and remember this, for nucleons. I think somewhere around the 10 to the mi OK, I need to look this up. So these quotes, of course, depend on how much it couples differently to protons and neutrons. Uh, for these constraints, OK, let me get back to that. The number I have in my head is around the 10 to the minus 2 level, but I should check that. And I'll come back to that in the discussion. OK, so um, these constraints uh, tell us that if our force is long ranged, pretty much that it's got a longer range than uh, less than a millimeter, then it should couple more weakly than gravity. It's got to be a very, very weak force. And that's uh, something that various people have been somewhat sort of uh, disappointed by, because they want to have new forces operating at astrophysical scales, doing interesting things in the universe, in cosmology, etc. So how robust are these constraints, and what kind of model building would you need to do to get around them? Do they apply to models which are simpler than just the sort of extremely simple scalar plus linear coupling model? So I'll talk a little bit about that. And the answer is not always. In some circumstances, you can have what's called screening. Okay. So the general idea here is we're going to add some nonlinear part to the equations of motion. So previously, if we just wrote down our thing and we have some coupling, let's just for simplicity say it's coupling to mass density here. This could be like our m neutron like coupling to uh, fermion masses or whatever. We'll just put a row in here, which we understand to mean the standard model sourcing for it. And so this was the model we had in mind in all of the discussion so far. And this is linear in phi. So we, the equation of motion would just be that uh, our d squared phi uh, plus m squared phi is equal to uh, g right. But we can also put in an additional potential term here. I mean, strictly speaking, this is part of the potential. But anyway. And if this potential has terms such as lambda phi to the 4, then in addition to this, we'll get a 
nonlinear term in the equations of motion. So whereas previously, we could just take our sources, we could take the Yukawa field due to one source, so this was an e to the minus mu, like x minus x1 over x minus x1. We could take the field from this one, e to the minus mu, x minus, if this is a position x1, this is a position x2. x2 minus x over x minus x2. And then we can just add these up to get the field from both particles, or both little bits of elements of matter or whatever. Now we can no longer do this, because we have a nonlinear term here. So given an object, we need to actually solve this equation and figure out what's the overall field. OK, so for a uh, complicated object, or even for a circular object, this is not sort of a problem with a sort of trivial solution you can just write down. But effectively, what's going on is that if we have a value of the field phi, then instead of just a half m squared phi squared, we've got lambda over 4 phi to the 4 term. So this is if we m squared plus phi squared over 2, phi squared. So if phi has some uh, overall value, then that effectively looks like, oh, sorry, lambda, of course. Then it sort of looks like we've given it some effective mass squared, which is the original mass squared, plus lambda phi squared over 2. So roughly what it's going to be is that in areas where phi has got big, it looks like it's got some larger effective mass. And as we uh, wrote down earlier, a larger effective mass means that it drops off faster. So let's see what that sort of implies in action. So, um, yeah, let's... Uh, do some example of a source which is of radius r. So if we had a very small lambda, which is small enough to be negligible, then the phi here will be our source, which is g rho r squared over well, we'll ignore 4 pi and stuff, over r, outside this thing. So it'll have this form. So if unscreened. And the question we want to answer is, how big does lambda have to be in order that we change this? OK, so yeah, so we'll say that the lambda, the phi value just outside the object, is of order g rho r squared. So if uh, what we wrote down earlier makes sense, so we're assuming now that the mass, assume that the bare mass, m, is very small. So we're not going to worry about that making the four short range to start with. So we've got uh, our effective mass here, if you believe this, which is of order lambda phi just outside the thing squared, which is, goes as lambda g squared rho squared r to the 4. And parametrically, we'd expect this to matter if, so matters if the effective mass squared is larger than of order the scale of variation in this field. If the mass is small compared to the scale of variation, it's not really going to make any real difference. So this condition is the same as saying that we want the size of the object to be, so rearranging this, the same as saying we want the size of the object to be larger than 1 over g to the third rho to the third, lambda to the 1 over 6th. 
And if we do a sort of similar question, we say we have some large region of constant density, then if we just look at the mass, then um, the, the sort of energy in this thing goes as minus g rho phi plus a half m squared phi squared. So the value, so d h by d phi equals zero implies that phi is of order g rho over m squared. If instead, what's setting the value at which phi, so this is saying that the value in the middle of a big object when the mass is small compared to the size of the object saturates the value of order this. The larger mass, the smaller the value you saturate at. So instead, if lambda is big, then we saturate when the new h, so the h, the important part is now our lambda over 4 phi to the 4 thing, and making that stationary gives a saturation value which scales as a g rho to the third over lambda to the third. So comparing to this one, this is g rho over g to the two-thirds, rho to the two-thirds, lambda to the third. So comparing that to the effective mass, we see that we have the uh, same kind of effective mass that we were getting earlier. This is just this thing squared. So in both of these cases, and in general, we act, it acts like we have some effective mass which is set by this parameter. So the larger that lambda is, the larger the effective mass will be. And the more will be suppressed by the fact it looks like the force is shorter range than the bare mass would have told us. OK, so um, what kind of values for this parameter can we get? How much screening can we get with physical densities? So let's say that, uh, so we've got our m effective, which is the relevant value for a object of size, for object of density, whatever, of rho, is of order uh, g to the third, rho to the third, lambda to the sixth. So if we plug in some numbers, let's say that we look at g to be of order 1 over m Planck for gravitational strength coupling. And let's say we take rho to be like grams per centimeter cubed for a pretty normal material. And we take that all to the power of 1 third. That value is around 10 to the minus 3 eV, which in distance scales is 1 over about 0.2 millimeters. So that's a pretty small scale. That's telling us that if we have an object which is of normal density, then, whereas you might think that a long-range force where the range of the force was si larger than the size of the object would uh, result in the whole object sourcing the field, actually, it'll act as though it's only sourced by a very thin shell of the outside of the object. The field, sat the field that you would have got from inside just saturates, and the only, it's as if you just had the force coming from a shell of radius uh, inverse m effective. So if you, say, were in this circumstance, where you thought that your, uh, your bare mass was of order much larger than solar system scales, so the force would be uh, extremely long range, you can do all these tests. If instead it has a self-coupling, and this self-coupling can actually be tiny, if all we want to do is take this, because it's lambda to this 1 over 6, if we want to take this 0.2 millimeters and make it like a few meters or a kilometer or something, like for an astrophysical object, even for very, very small lambda, we can significantly suppress the uh, field sourced by large objects and so make it that these tests don't actually apply anymore. Okay, 
So this is a cool idea. So this is called the thin shell effect. And it means that, yeah, our tests won't work as we thought they would. Similarly, in a torsion pendulum setup, if instead of the whole like kilogram sphere of aluminium and beryllium feeling the force of the Earth or the Sun, you only have 0.2 millimeters of the outside of the sphere and a little bit of the rock nearby sourcing the field, then you're not going to get a big signal. However, this is still, if you sort of take the theory at face value, not enough to sort of make it easy to get very strong forces. And the reason is that uh, due to this thin shell effect, we no longer, things no longer look inverse square. So let's say that, uh, so yeah, still difficult to get forces, forces stronger than gravity. i.e. g larger than of sort of the inverse Planck scale as we're writing it. And like I said, the reason for that is that uh, if we take our, let's say we take a small object, then that, this which is smaller than the inverse mass scale associated with its density, then it will source the field from throughout. It'll look pretty much like an inverse square potential. If we have some larger object where the size is of order the effective mass squared, then the field will just starting to feel these nonlinear effects, so it'll have some more complicated profile. Uh, drawing these things out is, so this is sort of, that was our R and V, R and phi axes. It'll have some more complicated profile where it'll do something uh, and then flat inside. It'll do something uh, slightly odd inside, then we'll do something non-inverse square because it's still non-linear in the non-linear regime just outside. So you'll get some funny profile which doesn't look inverse square. So around distances of order the inverse effective mass, force violates the inverse square law strongly. So whereas uh, before, we might have thought that a long uh, force with a small bare mass, so a long range, wouldn't give a strong effect in inverse square law tests at short distances because you're still in the inverse square bit of the potential. If it's got this screening effect, then actually it can because it's got a different effective mass around materials. So, okay, numerically, what kind of... Uh, what kind of bounds do we get here? So if we plug in that number there, if we take lambda as large as we can, so we take the same parameters as before, we want a gravitational strength coupling, and we want, let's say, uh, 1 over 0.2 millimeters times uh, lambda as big as it can be to avoid strong coupling issues, so around 4 pi to the sixth, this comes out to be, uh, again, of the scale, so we just make this uh, a bit smaller, we're around 10 to the minus uh, 4 meters again. And remember that this was about the scale where the inverse square law, which is often abbreviated ISL, tests are sensitive to gravitational strength. So what you'd want to try and do is make the screening so, so strong that everything except tiny objects was screened and you could get away with it because tests of the forces from tiny objects are bad. But what this estimate is telling you is that even if we make the screening as strong as we can, we make lambda all the way up to the strong coupling limit, then the amount of screening we can get for a normal density object is only enough to screen a sort of 0.1 millimeter sized thing. And though that sounds good, that's still 
only just enough to get you in the regime of gravitational couplings. So it's pretty hard, and this is actually a more generic thing. So this was doing the case of a potential which was lambda phi to the four. We could put other potentials in here and see what happened, but uh, you get the same kind of effect. It's basically an energetic situation, but you get the same kind of bound. You are always in the regime where screening uh, doesn't work at distances small, uh, larger, sorry, smaller than about 10 to the minus four meter. Okay, so um, yeah. So we're in a situation where we have all of these uh, tests of short range forces are able to constrain uh, models where both the field just behaves linearly and where the field has some more complicated self-interactions uh, because you get these interesting variations across different distance scales. Okay, so uh, yeah, any questions on that part of things with forces in general? Okay, well, if not, then I'll switch tax a bit and I'll talk about the other side of things that I mentioned at the start, uh, production of particles. So this has all been about the forces that they mediate between standard model objects. Now we'll talk about uh, producing particles through standard model processes and uh, seeing evidence for their production and detection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the kind of vector. So, yeah, okay. So for vectors, there is one particular kind of vector where none of these things apply, and that's a dark photon. So if you have the, so if coupled to EM, so we have our A prime mu and then J mu, which is actually the electromagnetic current, so we're just coupling like the standard model photon, but with some reduced strength, then our bulk objects are neutral. So we don't get some kind of fifth force between big neutral objects. The tests you have to do to look at this are very different. You can look for, say, deviations from Coulomb's law. If you have some, make some charged shell, you can look for production in various astrophysical situations or laboratory situations, etc. But yeah, everything's different if you do this. But this is special. Uh, another kind of coupling, let's say we couple the B minus L current, so we couple, let's say we have our, so this is dark photon. Let's say we took the other current that's easy to uh, have a light vector for, which is B minus L. So this is also, the point is that these are the two conserved things within the standard model. Well, B minus L, as far as we know, uh, EM, it definitely should be because it's a gauge symmetry. B minus L is possible to gauge, so it's uh, potentially conserved. So there we have some G, some X mu, and we've got some J mu B minus L. So if we write this out, then this is for um, protons and neutrons, uh, protons, <coughs> sorry, so uh, yeah, for protons and electrons, that's the same as EM because an electron is minus one L, a proton is plus one B. So this is just like the EM current plus the current for neutrons. So this tells us that if we have some matter, then the EM thing is neutral because the protons and the electrons cancel, but we get some overall thing from the neutron current, so we do get bulk matter couplings. So if we have a long range B minus L vector, where long range actually only means longer range than sort of microns or so, then we will have fifth force limits. Going beyond this, the situation is actually somewhat more complicated because we'd be coupling to a non-conserved current. Now you all know that a uh, gauge boson has to couple to a conserved current. Uh, if it doesn't, then everything goes to hell. The sort of uh, deformation of that is that if uh, we have the X mu couples to J mu uh, like SM and J mu SM not conserved. Then 
there are processes where we have a load of standard model stuff colliding, or whatever, or decaying, or whatever, and we produce the longitudinal mode of the X gauge boson. Then the rate of this production of this gauge boson will be proportional to the coupling squared times the energy of the process squared over the mass of the X squared times whatever the else is going on in this process. So the point is that for a very light vector, this production, this uh, cross sec, this rate will grow very, very large. This is if it's just got some mass which we're assuming is a Stuckelberg mass, so it's from some high scale. If you have some Higgs mechanism or something at some low scale, then you need to worry about that and worry about the production of all the other particles. But if we just have a vector and it's just got some Stuckelberg mass, then you will have production which increases as you try and make the mass of your vector smaller and smaller. And this tells you why the gauge thing can't work, because as we take the mass to zero, the production rates of all these things go to infinity, so everything blows up and everything's bad. So that's sort of the quantitative version of why you can't uh, couple a massless particle like a photon to a non-conserved current. Okay, but then that means that if we look at sort of the plot of like mass of our particle and a coupling of our particle, we've got all of our fifth force things which have their usual behavior and whatnot, but we also have processes happening at high energies so this is like LHC or something, where we have some very high energy, and now we have some enormous ratio of energy over the mass of this vector, if we say down here. So these processes, instead of just lurking around at very high masses and high couplings, like they do for, say, a B minus L vector or whatever, actually look like this in that case. They get better and better in terms of coupling as the mass goes down, because it depends on G over MX. The point is that for an extremely light vector, which couples to a non-conserved current, the situation is actually somewhat different because the theory is kind of a bit sick. Uh, so you need to make the couplings incredibly light in order not to have high energy stuff mess with you. So these are the two examples that make sense and give you nice sort of long range phenomenology. And this one doesn't, and this one does give you fifth forces. Beyond that, everything goes a bit weird. But if, I mean, so yes, I mean, this, this implies that your thing is an EFT and has to break down at some scale, set by uh, the mass of the thing divided by the g. So yeah, everything has to be completed at that scale, which is not the case for the dark photon or the B-L. Those can just be good up to whatever scales. OK, so yeah, that's why the situation for vectors is somewhat more complicated. Um, theoretically, scalars are somewhat simpler. Yeah? No, no, self-interacting vectors are non-abelian gauge theories. So people certainly consider those, and people consider dark sector versions of them as well. People consider what would happen, okay, you have dark QCD, or something like that. And um, there's, there's enormous literature on that, and that's a thing. Um, but in terms of having, you might worry if you're, going to make the length, if you're going to make the mass very light there. Having some, say, dark QCD with some extremely long confinement scale, you, like cosmologically, things might get a bit weird there. But people have certainly uh, considered this, and there are many papers on it. Okay, sorry, a bit of an aside there, but uh, useful to understand these things. All right, um, so let's go uh, back to where we were going. So like I said, all of this stuff was to do with forces mediated by this new particle. But in addition, we can look for the effects that come from producing this new particle and then detecting that it's being produced. Either like Tracy was saying the other thing, by seeing that some energy has gone missing and the consequence of that energy going missing, or by actually just producing it and then, detect, hit, then it hitting something else and you detect physically it hitting something else. Okay, so, I mean, all of these things uh, have been used and we'll talk about a particular thing that I very briefly went over yesterday, which is uh, stellar cooling. So the idea there is that we have our star, and we have a very hot inner core. And in the same way that if we produce neutrinos in this hot inner core, then they can just, with very high probability, make it all the way through the outer layers and up to infinity. If we produce new particles, they can do the same thing. Okay, so let's try and do more than we did last time and do some quantitative estimate of this kind of thing. 
So let's take the example of an axion, like uh, you've heard about many times by now, and let's look at the photon coupling like we were doing for direct detection. So we're going to say that we have our G A gamma gamma, our A coupling to the electromagnetic field strength uh, FF tilde. Okay, so we won't be able to do a proper estimate because this actually involves a lot of uh, messy integrals over Boltzmann distributions and things, but extremely roughly, uh, the process that we're looking at is a photon coming in, hitting another photon, and producing an axion. So this photon here might be coming from, like, scattering off an electron. So, Primakov process. The rate for this, parametrically, so we just have two photons, axion. If we're looking at the rate for a photon to convert to an axion, then dimensionally, if our core of our star is at some temperature T core, which we'll just call T here, then this can only depend on the G squared from there, and then we need a T core cubed in order to make it up. And we'll have like pies and stuff going on. So parametrically, that's roughly what we expect. If the only thing that matters is the temperature of the core. Okay, so then that means the production rate, so the number of axions that we produce per unit time, per unit volume, will be approximately the number density of photons times the rate at which they get converted to axions. Number density of photons is of order t cubed, so this will be our g squared t to the 6 over like, sorry, uh, 16 pi squared or whatever. Okay, and then that means that the energy that we lose from the star so the energy per unit time that we lose will be of order the volume of the core times and g squared over 16 pi squared times our t core, t core to the 7. Because this is the rate of axion production times the energy that each axion carries away. Again, there's only one scale, the temperature, so it'll be about t to the 7. So we see that you have a very high power of the temperature. OK, so that's all good. Um, it's going to be some big number because the sun is big and the sun is hot. But what's it? But g is quite small here. g is some uh, 1 over 10 to the 10 GV or something like that, the thing models that we might care about. So uh, how can this compete with all the rest of the energy that the sun is losing? So parameters that we've got are for the sun, the temperature of the core is around KeV, and the radius of the core is about 0.5 light seconds. Okay, how much energy is it losing through other means? Fairly obviously, the main mechanism by which the sun loses energy is just emitting photons from its surface. So you have black body photons being emitted from the surface and streaming out into space. So the power that the sun is losing like that is just set by the Stefan Boltzmann law. So the power loss from the surface is of order the A of the surface times the temperature of the surface to the 4 times the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is in natural units pi squared over 60, because that's what it is. The T surface is around 6,000 Kelvin for the sun. So uh, Kelvin is um, 10, so let's get this right. Uh, so, I found, so 10,000 Kelvin is around an EV. So this is somewhere in the regime of EV, which makes sense because it's emitting optical photons. So it's much, much colder than the core. And the radius of the sun is around seconds. So we can compare the energy loss from the core due to axions to the energy that the sun is losing all the time just through photons at its surface. So the luminosity in axions over the luminosity at the surface goes like putting all these things together. Uh, we get that it's 4 times 10 to the 9 g squared seconds 
times t core to the 3, just doing all the algebra, and putting in uh, units, this comes out to uh, 10, so g divided by 10 to the minus 8 gv inverse, all squared. So actually, that was just putting in all the numbers we had earlier, it's actually around 10, actually around 10 times this. Because we were extremely cavalier with all of our approximations here. But it gives you the right kind of order of magnitude. So it tells you that for a coupling to photons, which is somewhere in the regime of uh, 10 to the 8 GeV, GeV, 1 over 10 to the 8 GeV, then you get a luminosity in axions which is comparable to the luminosity in photons. Now that would fairly obviously be bad because we have very good models of the sun and we can check that it's behaving as it should, it's emitting the neutrinos as it should, we detect those, the, it's wobbling around as it should, which is helioseismology. And all of that agrees with there not being this extra energy loss channel. So measurements, so neutrinos and helioseismology, which is, like I said, just looking at how the sun wobbles, imply that the uh, luminosity in new stuff over the luminosity in photons should be less than of order sort of uh, 10%, which is somewhere around the neutrino luminosity. Otherwise, things definitely go bad. You can push it a bit further below, and then it's probably still ruled out, but there are a few lingering discrepancies of solar models. The neutrinos don't quite agree with the helioseismology, so it's a bit hard to say. But anyway, it certainly can't be bigger than about that, otherwise everything goes bad. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? Uh, it actually it goes the other way, it goes faster. Because what's happening in the sun is that, okay, you have all of the uh, gravitational, you have, so all of the stuff is uh, wanting to collapse to the center. And what's stopping it, so you have all the gravitational force, which is uh, making it want to go inwards, and what's stopping it is thermal pressure from the middle. So you have all of the kinetic energy of these things moving around, and the kinetic energy of these things, which is maintained by fusion reactions, giving you energy, stops it from collapsing. If you take energy out, then it's not able to do that as well, so it can't resist the gravity as much, so it contracts a bit. So this is the counterintuitive fact with gravitational systems. When you lose energy, it contracts, and everything speeds up and gets hotter in a temperature sense. So what actually happens is it runs faster. The center becomes a bit hotter, and it uh, goes through things quicker than it would. Um, well, that would be extremely drastic. I mean, if you had something like that, yeah, but I mean, of course, the limits that we have mean that it can only be a sort of few percent effect. But yes, uh, it's kind of, so it's often called stellar cooling, so people often call this stellar cooling, which is a misnomer. The core heats up. because of the gravitational contraction, which it can no longer resist as well. So that, that's the effect. OK, so um, what does this mean for our constraints on axions? So remember from last time that uh, we had, in a QCD axion model, say, we had the coupling to photons was somewhere around 10 to the minus 3 of the uh, 1 over FA in untuned dish models. So this, these things would be, so solar sun would imply that G A gamma gamma less than of order 1 over 10 to the 9 GV. So that would imply that FA is greater than of order 10 to the 6 GV, which corresponds to, um, so remember that previously, So the axion mass range that was misalignment was Fa of order 10 to the, mi 10 to the 11 GV and axion uh, masses 
which were summed to around uh, 10 to the minus 5 EV. So here, we're, a few order, we're five orders of magnitude uh, heavier axions and much more strongly coupled. So this is telling us one thing, that the QCD axion parameter space that our direct detection experiments are searching for was safe, like we saw in the plot last time. But uh, it's telling us that we can actually place a useful constraint on axions of, uh, it's also telling us that the QCD axion you'd be at a mass which was uh, still lower than the temperature of the sun, so it all makes sense. The axion is light enough that you could actually emit it. Okay, so um, that's one thing, but this is not so much an experiment. This is just astrophysical observations, though it is informed by helioseismology and neutrino experiments, which give us very precise models of the sun. You can also try and uh, do a direct detection of these things and see if it's better than just letting them stream by. So. The, missing the sun is a missing energy thing argument here. So we have that these things are emitted in the sun and just go out. But we can also see if we can produce them in the sun and then make some detector on Earth, like ADMX but different, and see if we can see the results of them actually hitting us. So can this, is this useful and can it let us do better than the naive energy loss arguments? Yeah. So it's certainly easy, but it's a tuning. So effectively, if we have, um, so our GA gamma gamma is our sort of numbers times one over F, so it's like one over FA times some number which you get just from QCD stuff. So if you just had our AGG dual coupling, you get it from that. And then if you have some uh, contribution from the anomaly, so you have, um, at, you have fermion, axion, fermion, fermion, fermion the loop. So if you have charged fermions which also carry PQ charge, then you get contributions to the anomaly, plus some, uh, yeah, some anomaly contribution. And this can get contributions from high-scale fermions as well, which are coming in. So Giovanni has a very nice paper where they do this calculation, get, these no get this number pro appropriately, and for different values for this anomaly coefficient, which can take some integer value, take some integer ratio, then you get different numbers here. But you'd need to tune it so you have some cancellation between these two things in order to get this to be very small. So you have a naturalist value, which is if these things don't cancel very much, and then for various values of this, you get smaller and smaller numbers, but you need to go to more and more tuned ratios here in order to get uh, very small coupling to photons. So, yeah. Ask Giovanni if you want to know more. He is the expert on this. All right. So, um, yeah. So back to the question of can we do better than just letting these things escape into space? Can we try and directly detect them on Earth? And the experiment that tries to do that is called CAST. So, it's the CERN Axion Solar Telescope, I think. So what it is, is, well, like AEMX, what we're searching for is Axion come in. We want to convert it to a photon, because that's the easiest thing. So we want to make a big B field, and we want to convert the Axion to a photon in the big B field. So what they have is they have a big tube, which was actually part of an AXC magnet. They have a big B field across it, so B0 of order 10 Tesla. This thing is about 10 meters long. And the thing is about, uh, the area is quite small because it was LHC, so this is about uh, 10 centimeters squared at the end. But it's a very big B field, which is good. So what you'd be searching for is, uh, let's extend this, an axion comes in, in the B field, it converts to a photon. The sun is emitting things at around a keV, so we'll produce a keV-ish photon, which is an X-ray. So we have some X-ray optics at the end. We take these photons, put them onto an X-ray detector, and our X-ray detector will see it and go bing. Okay, 
So that's the idea. Um, but what's the rate for this thing to actually happen? So if the axion is very light, then we can convert coherently to photons, and the uh, probability for an axion to convert to a photon is dimensionally, so it's got to depend on the coupling squared, it's got to depend on the B-field squared, and the only other thing it can depend on is the length that we give it to do the conversion. So that gives us length squared. So then uh, the other thing we need to know is how many axions are hitting us. So given the calculation before, axion flux, number of axions per second per unit area is, if we take g to be 10 to the 10 minus 10 g of e inverse, then this comes out as 4 times 10 to the 11 per centimeter squared per second from this kind of calculation done a bit more properly. OK, so how many x-rays do we get? So that means x-ray flux gives us dn gamma by dt is our axion flux. times our area, times our probability that our axiom converts to a photon. So putting all those things together, we get around 10 to the minus 4 per second for that coupling. So we see that even if we're at, uh, so the limit from the sum was about 10 to, 1 over 10 to the minus 9, sorry, 1 over 10 to the 9 GV, even for couplings which are an order of magnitude, uh, oh, sorry, this should have been squared, of course. Even for couplings an order of magnitude smaller, we can still get a rate which is like, if you do it for a good few weeks, you'd expect to see some X-ray photons. Whereas X-ray photons don't just randomly pop up. So CAST actually sets the best bounds on this um, axion photon photon coupling through doing this production in the sun and detection on Earth thing. The bound it actually sets is, as you'd expect from this calculation, g a gamma gamma less than the border 0.7 times 10 to the minus 10 inverse g v. And in the future, there's going to be an even bigger, better experiment called EAXO, doing much the same kind of thing, but just uh, on a larger scale. So EAXO, which is the International Axion Observatory, which is a bit of a stretch, but anyway. So this will uh, be able to get to less than of order a few times, 10 to the minus 12 GVM inverse, by basically using a larger area a bigger B field, better X-ray collecting objects, optics, just scaling cast up, but uh, will give significantly the best bound on the axion photon coupling. Now, we're still not in a regime where it's going to be ruling out dark matter that AVMX, et cetera, will be searching for, because this, remember, implied that G A gamma gamma was somewhere of order 10 to the minus, so about 1 over 10 to the 14 GV. But it is an interesting thing at the higher mass range, if you have other production stories, and is also intrinsically interesting just because uh, the QCD axion is not the only target. Other axion-like particles are certainly something we're interested in and might want to find. So this is a nice example of an experiment which is uh, using both astrophysics and precise detection, precision detection techniques on Earth to put constraints on um, light particle models. So um, yeah, OK, I think. Now is question time. Yes. But here you don't because the axon is emitted relativistically. So that's the point. Because the axon, so the energy of the axon here is of order KV. And down here, the mass of the axon is, say, well, we're looking at 10 to the minus 5 EV. So the gamma factor for the axion is, so this is 10 to the 3, 10 to the 5, 
is around 10 to the 8. So it looks, if we plot an omega k thing, like it's almost on the light cone. It's like somewhere here. And we want to convert to a photon. We had a problem before because the axiom was non relativistic. Here it's super relativistic, so conversion to a photon is just fine, which is why we, exactly why we can use a big thing and still get coherent conversion, and it's all good. So that's easier to see in relativistic axions because of that. Yes? anyone cares about, or do they drop off at some point? Um, so they're flat, so it depends what you mean by care about. Uh, for the QCD axiom, pretty much yes. Um, but towards the higher end of the mass range, so, okay, here's our MA, here's our GA gamma gamma. So this is our sort of 10, to, 1 over 10 to the 10 GV or so. Bounds are like there. Now we can work out where this craps out, because what we want is that, uh, so the momentum, so we've got that our omega squared is equal to k squared plus m squared. Okay. So we've got our k squared is equal to omega squared minus m squared is approximately equal to omega squared. Uh, so our k approximately equal to omega 1 minus a half m squared over omega squared. K axion, omega axion. For our photon, we've just got that K photon is equal to omega photon. So uh, if we look at these things, we want that K gamma minus K axion times length is smaller than one in order not to have destructive interference. We want them to still be in phase throughout the whole length. Okay? So this, if they're at the same energy, which they are because the conversion doesn't give it energy. It's a static B field. So this tells us that uh, this is of order our half uh, m axion squared over omega axion times length. Okay. m axion uh, we can take to be, so we want to solve this for m axion. So we want to take that, uh, so m axion squared is of order um, omega axion over length. KEV over, say, 10 meter. So doing this out, sorry, uh, this is getting a bit silly. So if we do that, so we've got, this is, uh, <coughs> say, uh, 10 to the 3 EV over, so 10 meter is 10 times 10 to the 6 microns, and a micron is about an inverse EV. Okay? So this comes out to, uh, so we've got 10 to the 3 minus 10 to the 7, so it's about 10 to the minus 4 EV squared. This comes out to about 10 to the minus 2 EV all squared. So if the axial mass is greater than about 10 to the minus 2 EV, then we'll have a problem. It won't, we'll no longer get coherent conversion. So what you'll see here is that somewhere around, I mean, this isn't exactly right because the, there's a different energy distribution, et cetera, but somewhere around a bit less than an EV, the cast line goes up. What they do then is they can actually fix that by introducing some gas into the system to give the photon a different dispersion relation. So if you modify the photon dispersion, you can make the momentum match up again. So there's some complicated sequence of bumpy stuff where they've done some gas tricks to make the photon be uh, on resonance with the axion again, momentum-wise. But those crap out at some stage as well, and then you go right up. So around, like, yeah, somewhere around 10 to the minus 2 EV up to, like, some fra small fraction of an EV, and then it doesn't work anymore because you lose the momentum match. Um, yeah, any other questions? Okay. Well, let's thank it up again.